Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to this morning's worship service. A special welcome to you if you happen to be a guest or a visitor with us today. And we're delighted to have you with us. Um, we have quite a few things going on today, and I anticipate that's why maybe our attendance is a little lower at this service because, uh, well, I'll get around to all that. But first of all, if you parked in the upper parking lot, you probably noticed the very large white whale parked up against the church building. Uh, the new bus has arrived. Uh, you may remember when we uh, did the fundraising for the first bus, the smaller bus, the one with the handicap ramp and all of that, um, there was about $17,000 left over from the first fundraiser. And, the, and from that moment on, we anticipated and knew we were uh, going to get another bus. The other bus would be larger. It doesn't have a handicap ramp, but it does carry more individuals. That bus has arrived. It's out front. It will be open if you would like to go out and uh, take a look at it. It's not too shabby either. I mean, that's a beautiful, beautiful bus, and, and we got a good deal on it. Um, we won it in the lottery, or I don't know, no. <laughs> but um, I hope you take a, take a look at it. We're really looking at expanding. Uh, already we have conflicts with the other bus when we need two buses for different things and, and other challenges. And the other bus, as nice as it is, is uh, uh, not nearly as large and can't carry as many people. And we're looking to expand our bus ministry and do some different things. So uh, we're excited that it's there. Um, I anticipate there may be a request from the church uh, it, for those who feel so inclined and are looking for something to do uh, with their uh, earthly treasure to glorify God. They'll probably be sending out some sort of letter inviting you to... Um, uh, help out with uh, whatever remainder funding is on the bus, but uh, it's there, and I'm and I'm certain glad it's there, and I think you're going to really be impressed with it. Um, new member orientation will be today at noon, so uh, there'll be a number of people that typically attend this service that are probably coming to the second service today because following the second service in the fellowship hall, we'll have our new member orientation meeting. And I think the last number was somewhere around 30 plus individuals who will be um, uh, considering um, making membership here at American Lutheran. Uh, there's in the next uh, few weeks. Also, um, I uh, want to lift up prayers for the uh, Mowry family. Helen Mowry passed away, and uh, I know they're um, looking at, I don't know what the, the sort of arrangements they are planning for that, but just ask you to lift Helen's family and friends up in prayer at this time as they grieve. Also, just a reminder to you that the prayer team is available. If you have a prayer need, gather here at the altar rail closest to the pulpit. At the conclusion of today's service, one of our prayer team members will be glad to meet you there, greet you, and to share a prayer with you. With that, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and stand as you are able. We'll quiet our minds, center our hearts, prepare to come into the worship of our Lord. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness patient God. Sometimes we are just too busy for our own good. We pledge ourselves to hectic schedules, demands on time, energy and resources that erode all too quickly. We seem to be rushing through life. The cries of those in need 
often go unheeded in our blur of activities which sap our energy, our resources, our spirits. Slow us down a bit, Lord. Remind us again that we are responsible for the care of this world, for reaching out and offering your healing love. Help us to hear the words of patient love that you have for us. Remind us again of Jesus' words to his disciples when he told them that they should love one another as he loved them. May we take time to bear witness to that love in all that we do. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God dwells among us, giving to all who believe the repentance that leads to life. Rejoice in the Lord, for we are forgiven people. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. O oh Lord God, you teach us that without love our actions gain nothing. Pour into our hearts your most excellent gift of love, that, alive by your Spirit, we may know goodness and peace through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you, Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is from Psalm 148. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise God in the heights. Praise the Lord, all you angels. Sing praise, all you hosts of heaven. Praise the Lord, sun and moon. Sing praise, all you shining stars. Praise the Lord, heaven of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, who commanded, and they were created, who made them stand fast forever and ever, giving them a law that shall not pass away. 
Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and fog, tempestuous wind, doing God's will. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds. Sovereigns of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the world. Amen. Old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, whose name is only exalted, whose splendor is over earth and heaven. The Lord has raised up strength for the people and praise for all faithful servants, the children of Israel, the people who are near the Lord. Hallelujah. The second reading is from the book of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, that they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this. For these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am in the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Please stand. gospel for this fifth Sunday of Easter is from uh, St. John the 13th chapter. Uh, The context for this is Jesus and the Last Supper in the upper room. Uh, When Judas had gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of Man has been glorified. God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. But I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. And grace to you and peace from God, our Father, from our Lord, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. A lot of things happening this time of year, but for many in our community, this is a time when thoughts, prayers, turn to um, young men and women who will be graduating from high school. And we know that some of them will go on to study in institutions of higher learning. Some of them may go on to take classes in biology, sociology, psychology, zoology, geology, and well, a whole host of other ologies. And some of them may even go on to study theology. Theology is uh, a word that gets thrown around a bit in sacred and not so sacred circles. Um, 
But where does the word theology come from? Well, the Greek word uh, for God is theos. The suffix ology is used to describe really the study of something or seeking to discern about something. So theos, God, plus ology, the study of, well, then theology is basically the study of God. Trying to understand God, to discern God and God's will for our life. And in essence, all of us here have been called and encouraged to be a theologian. That is to be a student of the study of God. A student seeking to discern God, who God is, and also to discern God's will for us and God's will for the whole world. So theology's goal ultimately is godly discernment. There are a number of theological terms that are used, um, but I'm going to share with you two theological uh, terms today um, that describe a particular spiritual approach that a Christian may have in regard to their faith journey. Um, this is nothing new. It goes back quite a ways. In fact, what I'm going to talk about today was really um, part of the major writings of Martin Luther in the 1500s, right? Um, so it's been around a while, and he used uh, these two theological terms as a way of helping Christians to discern, to define what a faithful Christian um, is really like. So the first term uh, that I'll be talking about today is a theology, that is an understanding of God, um, of glory. We understand God most clearly um, in the empty tomb, in the power of God to defeat death, God's glory. The other uh, term I'm going to be talking about is theology of the cross, where the focus is maybe less on the empty tomb and the power of the resurrection, and instead the focus on what Jesus did, what Jesus accomplished upon the cross. Um, this theology of glory has been around for a long time, and I understand uh, how it's become so popular, because even amongst modern-day Christians, um, you know, at Easter time, during the, the weeks of Lent leading up to Easter, a, a lot of churches today don't have a tradition of Lent, the weeks leading up to Easter. In fact, about the time Easter rolls around, um, they may celebrate a couple different things, some of them Good Friday, but a lot of, uh, a lot of churches that aren't mainline churches, uh, they, they, well, one Sunday you have Palm Sunday, Right, And Jesus comes in on the donkey to the hallelujahs and the palm branches and the, you know, he's the king, here comes the king, here comes the savior. And then the next Sunday, um, you get the empty tomb and you get the resurrected Christ. And um, so the, the, the cross tends to be in our world a little shortchanged, maybe. Um, just for your consideration, a lot of times when it comes to modern day Christians, evangelical Christians, um, non-traditional Christians, uh, if, if you wear a cross, your cross tends to be one without Jesus hanging on it, right? Um, the crucifix is the cross with Jesus hanging on it. And most Christians don't wear crucifixes. And most Christian churches don't have Jesus hanging on the cross in them. Uh, because we like empty crosses. We like crosses that show the victory of Christ um, that really leads to the empty tomb. So there's a lot of ways we kind of we don't try to, but it just, this whole theology of glory 
sort of sneaks into our understanding of God. Now, the unfortunate thing is, because God sure is glorious, and the empty tomb sure is glorious, and it's, and it's good to celebrate that resurrection for what it means for us and what it means for the world. But unfortunately for us, this theology of glory, the empty cross, the empty tomb, has come for many Christians to mean this. And then I'll explain how we got there. That faithful Christians and faithful adherence to Christianity should be, because of their faithfulness, because of their righteousness, they should be recipients of special status, special treatment from God. Now you go, well, oh no, I never thought that. Well, think about it. Uh, it really doesn't sound that outrageous, right? I mean, don't we, isn't that how we sort of sell the program to our children and grandchildren? If you are a faithful Christian, if you walk in the ways of Christ, um, there will be great benefits for that in, in life and certainly in death. And, and you live a good life and a righteous life. We know we live in a world where um, you're supposed to be rewarded for doing the right thing. And, and it's oftentimes easy for us to sell the program, so to speak. I, I mean, I don't think the greatest sales tool that the uh, Christian church has is join us and suffer. Join us in sacrifice. No, no, we sell the program. The program is join us and receive rewards. And of course, the ultimate reward being our eternal home in heaven. So I understand how this theology of glory kind of morphed um, into this idea of rewards and compensation for faithfulness. Uh, theology of glory has been growing in popularity for many years now. It's been around for a long time, but um, it usually goes by a different name nowadays. Um, and I don't think necessarily you've heard this either, but, but it's called the prosperity gospel. You may not know much about the prosperity gospel, but you may have heard things over the years about like the prayer of Jabez. Uh, was part of the whole prosperity gospel movement. Um, the prosperity gospel adherents basically focus in on the, the rewards, the compensation of the Christian life. And when you hear the proponents of it, you'll understand why it's gaining so much traction in the world. Um, one of the earliest, uh, not, but one of the more famous earlier proponents of the prosperity gospel was Robert Schuller in the hour of power um, and, and faithful Christians and positive thinking and all the stuff that comes out of that, making our scars into stars with a lot of emphasis on the stars. And, uh, but, but quickly, we move on to other names that um, propose the prosperity gospel. Oral Roberts, no small fish in the big pond, right? Joel Olstein, one of the more well-known purveyors of the prosperity gospel. Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, T.D. Jakes, Joseph Prince. Now, all of these folks and many others like them, all, they all have a number of things in common, not the least of which they're televangelists and with very wide followings, right? Um, the other thing they all have in common, interestingly enough, they are all very, very, very wealthy. Really wealthy. And there's nothing wrong with being wealthy and working hard. Um, but I do remember this. When I uh, graduated from seminary, I was going to my first call. My uh, father-in-law offered us a gift. It wasn't new, but it was used, but it was really nice. And it was the gift of a new, newer Cadillac. Oh man, he got a smoking deal on that, right? And my father-in-law is a very generous guy. And he said, you know, I, I'm, I want to give you this Cadillac. This car is a good car. It'll last you a long time. It's got a lot of bells and whistles. You've worked hard. You deserve it. And the first thing that came to my mind was, 
wow, I'd like to have that Cadillac. My second thought was very quickly, there is no way I can have that Cadillac. Uh, there's no way I can go as a new student, fresh out of seminary, into a congregation, driving an almost new Cadillac. So he said, okay, well, all right, I'll come up with something else, and we ended up with a Lumina. There's a big difference between a Cadillac and a Lumina, but I'll tell you, the Lumina wasn't going to get me some of what you would get necessarily as, as one who drove a Cadillac. I mean, I think that some of us knew, you know, uh, th there are just certain things pastors do and certain things pastors don't do. And, it's, you know, I've long since got over that whole car thing and what people think about what kind of car I drive and, and that sort of thing. But, but I understood, I, I didn't want to make any trouble for myself. And pastors aren't supposed to be living high on the hog, right? And, and uh, well, don't tell that to Oral Roberts or Joseph Prince or B Benny Hinn or Joe Olstein because they do very, very, very well for themselves. But I also think that when that is the lifestyle you live, very openly, it's probably not surprising then that you would preach a gospel that that's the lifestyle everybody should have. And the reason why we should have it is because God wants us to be prosperous. And I don't doubt that God wants us to be prosperous. But are we talking earthly rewards or are we talking other kinds of rewards or are we talking both? And that's this whole thing about this theology of glory and the prosperity gospel and the proponents of it. But this is the challenge to the prosperity gospel that says those who are faithful will prosper. Those who are faithful will prosper. What happens when as a Christian the payoff of earthly rewards does not match up to our perceived faithfulness? What happens not if but when our health or wealth or success elude us? and elude our reach? What happens when, in fact, things go the other way and we all of a sudden find ourselves struggling mightily, sacrificing, uh, uh, suffering, or, or the object of ridicule? Because in Jesus' day, there was a very clear theology. There was a reason why lepers were lepers, and there were reasons why people were born blind. There were reasons why some people had a lot, and some people didn't have a lot, and it all boiled down to faithfulness. Who sinned that this man was born blind? Was it his parents or him? But the thought was, bad things happen to bad people. Good things happen to good people. Bad things don't happen to good people. If it's, it's in the book of Job. It's written all over the pages of the book of Job. Of course, God poo-poos it, but there were his friends. Job, you look righteous, but there's something going on underneath because God is really hammering you. You're losing it all. You lose your wife. You lose your children. You lose your home. You must be a bad person, Job. So when the, when, when the prosperity gospel says, and the righteous will be rewarded, and you're not being rewarded, what does, how does that jive? When bad things happen to good, faithful, righteous people like Job, how does that jive? If we follow the theology of the glory, if we follow this prosperity gospel and its proponents, how do we square that with misfortune? How do we square it with suffering? When faithful Christians are supposed to be rewarded spiritually, physically, financially for their faithfulness. You know, you know the dark place where this is going to go. Those who are not rewarded now are not rewarded because they have not been faithful enough. You can believe that the first century Christians were confronted with this perplexing problem. This was a, see, instead of living vital sun-tanned lives brimming over with prosperity, the early Christians experienced a heavy dose of persecution. 
a lot of persecution. In fact, they were driven eventually from their homes and from their jobs and their livelihoods and, and their lives were threatened and that's why so many of them fled from Jerusalem to Damascus. Not only did, did being a Christian for them mean hardship and suffering, but I will tell you this, it also surprised the living daylights out of them. Because they thought, because they had been taught by the religious leaders, the righteous will be rewarded. They followed Jesus. They took great risk to follow Jesus. And yet they found themselves on the run being hunted by people like Saul and others arrested and persecuted. And some like Stephen being martyred. They thought God should treat them better than that. And I'm telling you, we still do. And part of the reason why we still think that is because we have so many people like Oral Roberts and Joel Olstein and Robert Schuler and, and Joseph Prince, and, and the purveyors of the prosperity gospel. They keep repeating that stuff over and over and over again. After we've committed our life to the Lord Jesus Christ, most Christians think we ought, that ought to be worth something. And they think it ought to be worth something than heaven. Though heaven is great, but they also think living a good life now should get you the rewards you deserve. That's the theology of glory. It's supposed to pay dividends to be a Christian. And I, and I suppose that's true. But it depends on how you define dividends. What are the dividends of being a Christian? Is it earthly rewards? Is it earthly treasure? Is it a, a pain-free life? You know, do we not have to worry about cancer because we love Jesus? Is that the way it works? Let's take a closer look at our gospel reading. The setting is the upper room. A few hours before Jesus' arrest. Judas has just left. Um, to, by the way, betray Jesus. Last I checked, Jesus was a pretty righteous guy. He's going to have a tough few days. And it all begins with Judas. Somebody he trusts, somebody who's been by his side for three years, is about to betray him. Boy, Jesus must have been a bad boy. So Judas leaves to betray Jesus. Jesus turns to the disciples and says... <laughs> He says, now is the Son of Man glorified. Oh boy, are you going to see my glory. And God will be glorified in my glory. And from there, Jesus goes out to be arrested like a common felon. He is publicly flogged, ridiculed, and finally subjected to utter humiliation, nailed stark naked upon a cross. Wow. Wow. Now is the Son of Man glorified. And common sense says what Jesus experienced on Good Friday is far from glory, and we get it. That's why we take him off the crosses. We can't have a Jesus hanging on the cross. That's not glory. Glory is not in suffering. Glory is not in dying. Glory is in the empty cross that represents the empty tomb, the ultimate victory of God. In fact, the whole thing begins to sound pretty scary. It sounds scary because Jesus said, Remember the word that I said to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecute me, they will persecute you. It doesn't say anything there about your righteousness, about your good behavior, about how, how well you're walking the walk. He just says they will persecute you. Why? Because you are associated with me. Which brings me to this other theological term for today, which is the theology of the cross. Jesus said, contrary to the teachers in the temple, Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Let him go without. Let him not be the recipient of great things. Let him deny himself. Denied of what? Well, you can figure out what they're denied of. And then Jesus says, and let that one take up his cross. 
and follow me. In baptism, the pastor makes the sign of the cross upon the forehead of the child or the adult. And these words, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit and you have been marked with the cross of Christ forever. What does that mean? What does it mean to be marked with the cross of Christ forever? I just remembered a joke. It's like, uh, it's a terrible joke, but I, I've shared it before. Why is it that Jesus makes the or that Christians make the sign of the cross? Because being stoned to death wouldn't work. You know, this looks so much better than. So Jesus had to die on a cross. We are marked with the cross of Christ forever. What do you think of the cross? What is it a sign of? The cross is a sign of suffering. The cross is a sign of sacrifice. Suffering and sacrificial love. That is the power we wield as Christians who are Christ's body in the world. We wield the power of suffering. We wield the power of sacrifice. We wield the power of walking in the one whom suffered the most and sacrificed the most. The, there are easier, softer ways. And, and most of the world lives by easier, softer ways than that. They're not into suffering and they're not into sacrifice. And I understand that. What, what I don't... What bothers me more is that when Christians buy into that, because that's not what the Bible says. That's not what Jesus says. And it's not, regardless of what Joel Olstein says or Oral Roberts or Kenneth Copeland or anybody else, it's not what Jesus says. And for heaven's sake, never ask, what would Jesus do? No. No. Because it's not hard to understand why so many of us buy into a theology of glory. That you do the right thing, you get your just reward. Because we don't ask what Jesus would do. We are marked by the glory of the cross. And it is in the shadow of the cross that we receive our identity. It is in the shadow of the cross that we are called to be God's children in this world. It is in the shadow of the cross that we walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And it is in the shadow of his cross that we take up our cross and follow him. What would Jesus do? Where would Jesus go? How would Jesus respond to any given situation? I'm telling you folks, the theology of glory as it is put forth by the proponents of the prosperity gospel is a hideous heresy. It's a false teaching. It's not even remotely close to the reality that is exposed in scripture or by the words of Jesus. Imagine reducing God's steadfast love to fickle favor, a favor which the Lord trickles out to us in proportion to our faithfulness, in proportion to how well we have been behaving ourselves. I mean, given the difficult and impoverished lives of the early Christians, it soon became clear to them that the world's idea of glory stood in stark contrast to the glory of the cross. It is the Apostle Paul who just laid it on the table. He said, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. The glory to which we are called, it's a strange kind of glory. It is rooted not in our faithfulness, but in God's faithfulness. It's rooted, it's characterized not by our success, but it is characterized by our willingness to serve and to sacrifice and to live in the shadow of the cross so that Jesus will be successful. This concept is illustrated in a modern day parable. So I'm going to share it with you and we'll wrap it up. It's called the parable of Horval Sash. Now, Horville, Horville had a very humble job in the, uh, 
in the offices of the largest corporation in the world. Horville worked as a gopher. He worked in the lowest reaches of that corporation, down in the basement in the mail room. His job was to help other people to be successful, help other people to do their jobs better. But Horville couldn't help but wonder about the floor above him because he could hear footsteps up there. He knew there was another floor up there. Um, one day, uh, Horville was uh, in, in the mail room and he saw a little bug scurry across the floor. And so he raised his foot to flatten the helpless little speck and the, and the bug spoke. He cried out, spare me. Spare me, a bug, a, a speaking bug. Now, Horville stopped because a speaking bug is something kind of special. And uh, so he had a little conversation with the bug. The bug was very glad that Horville spared him. And the bug said, you know, I can grant you a wish. And Horville thought for a moment. He said, you know what I wish? I wish to be promoted to the next floor. And so the talking bug granted Horville's wish. And Horville's boss that very day promoted him from the basement to the first floor. That very day. But then Horville was there and he heard footsteps above him on the ceiling above him. And Horville heard those footsteps and he realized there was now another floor above him. And he real, he's already figured out that a higher level means higher wages, more power, more glory. The next day Horville asked the bug for another wish. And the bug says, sure, no problem. You spared my life. He says, well, I want to go to the next floor. And, and of course, his wish was granted. And with each floor, of course, would come promotions. And each promotion would be like kerosene on a flame. And so Horville went from floor to floor to floor, to the 10th floor, to the 20th floor, to the 50th floor, to the 70th floor, until finally Horville reached the penthouse on the 96th floor of the tower. Horville was now the highest. He was the most powerful. And for a while, he was content. When suddenly, Horville sees some kid out on the observation deck up there by the penthouse. And the boy is on the edge of the deck looking out over the landscape, the city that's spread out there. And, and the little boy has his eyes closed and he has his eye, uh, hands folded. And Horville asks the little boy, what are you doing? And the little boy says, I'm praying. And, and he's praying? Yeah, yeah, I'm talking talking to God. To whom, he said? And he says, to God. And he points up. Oh, that's, that's bad news for Horville. Up? You mean there's, there's another floor above me? You know, and, and he said, I, I, don't, see, I can't hear the footsteps up there. All I see is the clouds and, and, and panic gripped Horville. And he, and he said, he asked the boy, is there, an, is there something else above? And, and, and he said, yes, there, there is. Of course there is. There is God. There is more. There is God. So Horville summoned the bug. He says to the bug, make me God. Make me the highest. And that shouldn't surprise us. That was his goal all along. So Horville says to the bug, he says, put me in the position that God would hold if he were on earth. And so the very next day, Horville found himself at work as a gopher in the basement. <laughs> Did you see it coming? Where would God be in the office tower of the world? Would he be living in the penthouse? Is that where Jesus would be? Or would he be down in the trenches? Would he be in glory? Is that his glory? Or is his glory in his suffering and in his sacrifice and in his servanthood? See, the glory of God is that he comes to love us and serve us. And see, when you don't get Monday, Thursday, and you don't get the washing of the feet, and you don't get the commandment, another commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, when you don't get the Jesus on the cross, the bloody beaten Jesus suffering and dying on the cross. When all you get is hallelujahs on Palm Sunday and empty tombs on Easter, you get a different idea of who God is. I'm just saying. But it is our glory to live and love 
like Jesus. That is our glory. We find our glory in the trenches, folks. Not in earthly rewards. In the trenches. So, wrapping it up. A pastor overheard his two sons playing church. What else would a pastor's kids do, right? Play church. And so the older son was speaking to the younger son. And, and he said to him, he says, Do you know what it means when the pastor does this? And the little, little boy said, no, I don't know. And the older son was explaining to him. Well, what it means is, is that some of you go out this way and some of you go out that way. <laughs> and the pastor thought to himself, the boy is right. Because it is the cross that sends us out and scatters us into the world. Someone has said that the really important thing for any church is not how many seats it has filled, not how many seats, but how many it sends. Or you can have a church of 3,000 people all sitting there, hearing a prosperity gospel sermon, anticipating their next big reward, or you can have a church of 60, and they're all leaving the next day to go out into the world and bust the hump. For Jesus. So God sends you out into the world. And some will go this way and some will go that way. And some, some will not believe a word I just said. And they will continue to pursue. If they have been pursuing, they will continue to pursue a theology of glory. And they will labor and labor and labor for the earthly wards that they deserve. And they will hope, they will hope that they receive them. But those who serve in the shadow of the cross look forward not to the earthly rewards they hope for that spoil and fade and decay, but they will look forward to the reward that they have been promised, the reward that endures forever, which the faithful will receive in heaven. The message of the cross is foolishness, folks, to those who are perishing. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. You go this way or you go that way. One path can lead you to a theology of glory and the other to the theology of the cross. You go this way or that. It's your choice. May God help you choose wisely. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able. We'll sing our hymn of the day.
Let us profess our faith in our words of the Easter Creed. I believe in the God of Easter morning. pessimism, the stunning hope of angelic proclamation. I believe in the God of Easter Day. I believe in the God of Easter Evening, who breaks into our closets and prisons bringing peace and crushing our fear. I believe in the risen Lord who meets us with wounds on his hands and feet, who grants us his spirit, sending us out to bring shalom to the world. Amen. Gathered into one by the Spirit, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of God's creation. God of eternal love, You have redeemed us. You have called us each by name. Your grace is sufficient for us. Your power is made perfect in our weakness. Grant to all of your children a glimpse of your glory. Present us with opportunities at every turn to bring your salvation message to all who hunger for hope. Christ is risen. God of all comfort. Let your peace be upon the friends and family as they mourn the loss of Helen Maury and bring peace to all who are in a season of grief. Let them take comfort in the risen Lord. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Almighty Lord God, We ask that you would send gentle rains to wipe out the fires that are raging throughout our country. And we humbly ask you to extinguish the fires that rage in the hearts of all who wage war on their helpless victims. Bless and protect all who glorify your holy name by sowing seeds of love. Let their light shine forth so that the world may see your glory. Christ is risen. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We declare ourselves to be resurrection people. Jesus took the bad news of sin and guilt, and he changed it to good news through his dying, and through his rising for us. We are here to celebrate that good news and the presence of Christ us. Jesus took bread. He blessed it, he broke it, and then he gave it to his disciples saying, Also he took a cup of wine. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, We thank you, Jesus, for these elements given in love for us. Accept us, forgive us, and heal us, that we might live lives that are pleasing to you. And so we pray together that prayer our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Wherever two or more are gathered in his name, Christ is there in the midst of them. The risen Christ dwells with us here. All who are hungry, all who are thirsty, come. Come.